For 60 years, attention has been focused on the conspirators who planned, organized, and executed the assassination of President John Kennedy in Dealey Plaza. They have largely gotten away with their crime. They have gotten away with murder. But they have also gotten away with a second murder, and the framing of an innocent man to take the blame for their cowardly and traitorous actions. They have ruined the name and legacy of a young man who served his country with a vigor and dedication few have matched. That young man is Lee Oswald. Let's look at the actual life and accomplishments of Lee Oswald up until the time of his murder when he was only 24 years old. By stepping back and viewing his life, it is possible to contrast his actions with those of the cowards who would shoot him down in the basement of the Dallas City Jail. Oswald enlisted in the United States Marine Corps on October 24, 1956, just one week after his 17th birthday. His primary training was in radar operation, which required a security clearance. In May 1957, he was granted final clearance to handle classified matter up to and including confidential, after careful check of local records disclosed no derogatory data. This is important as the Warren Commission and many so-called journalists paid under the CIA's Project Mockingbird will use Oswald's rough upbringing to chastise him as loveless and try to portray him as troubled. He was no more troubled than any other youth living in poverty and trying to exist without a father, and he was extremely intelligent. At Keesler Air Force Base in Mississippi, Oswald finished seventh in a class of 30 in the Aircraft Control and Warning Operator course, which included instruction in aircraft surveillance and the use of radar. He was given the military occupational specialty, of Aviation Electronics Operator. On July 9, 1957, he reported to Marine Corps Air Station El Toro in California. And it was at El Toro that the CIA recruited top candidates for their clandestine operations. These young Marines were perfect. They were young, dedicated patriots who were already cleared for top security operations. The Warren Commission states that when Oswald was in the Marines, he taught himself Russian. That assertion is ridiculous. How many 17 and 18 year old new Marines who are busy trying to achieve a confidential classification in radar and aircraft surveillance have time to teach themselves a language as difficult as Russian? Lee Oswald was identified as very bright and sent just up the California coast to the Monterey Language School, where he was taught Russian and became indoctrinated by the CIA for missions abroad. Most members of the Warren Commission, and especially former CIA Director Alan Dulles, knew these facts about Oswald, but chose to denigrate his name, reputation, and innocence by fabricating a fictitious lone nut theory surrounding him. I think it's really impossible at this point with the documentation that we have now to take the CIA out of the Oswald story. Clearly, he was involved with them at a very deep level. It's not clear at all how much he knew he was involved with the CIA. The CIA has what they call their witting assets and their unwitting assets. So it's possible he was being manipulated by people and he didn't realize who he was serving. But it's not possible that the CIA didn't know who Oswald was. Again, we just have this humongous paper trail. And one of the more interesting pieces of that is the way Oswald's file was opened and where it was opened in the CIA. Because Oswald was a Marine who had worked at a CIA base, the U-2 base in Atsugi, Japan. He defects to the Soviet Union and he offers to give the Soviet secrets. Now, this should have set off enormous alarm bells all over the United States government. And it did for the Navy, and it did for the FBI, 
But miraculously, or not, <laughs> the CIA did not open a file on Oswald at that time, even though they were in receipt of these, this information. And they were collecting information on Oswald in what we call soft files, uh, files that, how do I want to say it, belong kind of vaguely to a department. They're not under an individual's name. So information on Oswald is being tracked, but not in any one place that we can identify. And it wasn't until a year after Oswald had defected that the CIA finally opened a file. And again, you have a Marine who goes to the Soviet Union to tell secrets. You would think you might open a file in the Soviet Russia division uh, you know, as a suspected spy. And certainly in the counterintelligence division, that would make sense. But what happened was that Oswald's file was opened in an area of counterintelligence that was so small, only about five people worked for it. It was called SIG, the Special Investigations Group. And it was James Angleton's kind of personal, hand-picked, most closed-mouth, most trusted people because the official function of SIG, to the degree that anybody would clarify it for the HSC or, A or the other bodies that asked about it, uh, was that it was looking for moles in the agency, that they were the component within CI that was kind of investigating their own personnel in conjunction with the Office of Security, which is tasked with pre preventing infiltration of the CIA. So that component of CI, counterintelligence, worked very closely with OS, the Office of Security, uh, through this little tiny unit. And that's where Oswald's file was opened. And again, it was opened kind of a year too late. And the story of why it was opened is suspicious too, because uh, the CIA has claimed, well, we opened the file when the State Department told us you know, in December of 1960 that Oswald was one of these defectors they were looking into um, because various people had gone to the Soviet Union and the State Department was trying to figure out were these fake defectors, were these CIA agents going in and posing as defectors, or were these genuine defectors? And so they asked the CIA kind of which of these are yours. And interestingly enough, when that response, when that question came in, the answer was broken out. Some defectors were responded to from one department and some defectors were responded to from another department. And the kind of the general area of response was told, don't look at these five people. And Oswald was one of those five people they were told not to look into that a response on them would be prepared separately. And it was, and again, somebody in the Office of Security knew that I should route this to the counterintelligence unit, which is odd because again, the file supposedly didn't exist yet but they knew where to send the request for Oswald and they knew that it should be kept separate. It's so easy to explain that if Oswald was a counterintelligence dangle sent to the Soviet Union to see you know, who bit. Because right then, uh, counterintelligence had faced um, a counterintelligence threat. They had a high-level agent named Popov in the Soviet Union, what they call a defector in place. He wasn't coming over to America. He was working his regular job but feeding us information. He had been picked up. That was a huge red flag. It turned out Ironically enough that it was the CIA who had accidentally blown his cover, but at the time they didn't know that's what had happened and they thought, oh, the Soviets are on to us. And separately, Popov had told them that they, there seemed to be a high-level source, specifically on the U-2 program. Um, I'm going to go back because I'm not sure if it was Popov who said the U-2 program, but the CIA had reason to believe that uh, somebody in the high level in the U-2 program appeared to have been giving information to the Soviets because they seemed to know things they should not have been able to know. And Oswald knew a lot of highly technical data. He'd worked as a radar operator at this U-2 base in Atsugi. He knew the altitude that the planes fly. He knew the speed. He knew, you know, all kinds of, like, which radio frequencies they use. In fact, after his so-called defection, um, all those codes had to be changed. Uh, but it makes so much sense, again, if Oswald was sent over there to see who bit, who wanted to know about the YouTube program, and if they didn't bite, that meant they did have a source in the program and they didn't you know, need to know about it. And so interestingly enough, it appears that they probably really did have a mole because it doesn't appear the KGB showed much interest in Oswald once he got there. In fact, other people from the KGB said they kind of assumed he was a CIA agent. We weren't fooling anybody except maybe the American public. March 1961, Oswald met Marina Prusakova, a 19-year-old pharmacology student. They married six weeks later. Her uncle worked for Soviet domestic intelligence, and questions later would be raised about whether Marina herself was an agent. Oswald and Marina applied at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow 
for documents that enabled her to immigrate to the U.S. just one week later. One week. The U.S. Embassy gave Oswald a repatriation loan of $435.71, and Oswald, Marina, and their infant daughter left for the United States. Does it make any sense that Oswald would be allowed back into the U.S. almost immediately and given a loan if he was a real defector? The CIA will report they never bothered to interview Oswald. Of course that is a lie, and for decades nearly every fact that the CIA will report about Oswald, including in Mexico City and the weekend of the assassination, will be a lie. Why the Central Intelligence Agency to this day withholds critical documents about their relationship with Oswald speaks volumes. If he was truly a lone nut shooter, the CIA would have revealed everything they possessed about Oswald immediately after Dealey Plaza. Oswald was also given a job at Jager, Charles & Stover, a photographic firm that contracted to make highly classified maps for the U.S. Army. A job he could never have gotten without the confidential clearance he earned and a job at the Riley Coffee Company, a CIA front company in New Orleans. Does this sound like a true defector to Russia? <laughs> if he wasn't an agent, is there any way he would have been allowed to defect, knowing what he did? Where That's he a went? really good point. That's a really good point. And there is an answer to that in the CIA files. It's actually in Oswald's file for no apparent reason, and it's related to an incident that happened later. But uh, there was a man named Eldon Henson, who was a military guy who wanted to defect through Mexico City, in this case, to the Soviet Union um, and offer up military secrets. The CIA ran an operation against him. They sent somebody in posing as the Russian, debriefed him, figured out what he was going to do, and then it turned him over to the FBI and had him arrested. That's what we would expect. Now, obviously, we didn't have the ability to send the FBI into the Soviet Union to arrest them, but you would think the guy at the embassy would, like, lock the door and not let him out. You know, you're a high risk and, you know, I'm not letting you leave here until I talk you out of this. Or the security at the embassy would arrest him. I mean, the espionage for a foreign country is a crime. Defection is not a crime, but, but if you're defecting to turn over secrets, it is. But, yes, when he does come back to America, he doesn't come you know, begging and scraping his way back to America after supposedly defecting an offering to sell the Soviet's military secrets. He comes on a military hop. How do you do that if you've had a dishonorable discharge from the, you know, the Marines and if you've gone to the Soviet Union? But again, if you're an intelligence agent and your assignment is over and you're ready to come back, it makes perfect sense. Also, even the way he got to the Soviet Union was a little bizarre because he got in through Finland at a time where pretty much only the CIA knew that that was an easy route in. It was much easier to get through the border there than going you know, through other routes into the Soviet Union. He also managed to get to Finland at a time when no commercial flights were there. So that was something the Warren Commission never quite solved. They couldn't quite figure out how he actually you know, which planes he took because no commercial planes were flying at the times that would have gotten him there.